Harlan, and Happy New Year. Wonderful 2023. It's amazing. We would love to connect with you this morning. So if you can drop your name and where you're watching us from in the comment in the chat box below. I would like to welcome you guys. I, if you don't know who I am, I am Daniel. This is my beautiful wife, Amber Fields. Hi. We've been coming here for two wonderful years. Yep. Feels like a long time, but married for 20. This, this year. year. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, super exciting. We are so happy to have you here. Super grateful that you've joined us. Um, the thing that I love most about Heartland is they know how to kick off the new year with they a bang. Do. Pastor Nick brought it this morning. The they message did. was amazing. So you are in store for something great. We've had a wonderful holiday season and we hope that you have too. Uh, and we hope that you're kicking the new year off right. And I especially think that uh, starting here with, with Heartland is a really good way to start that. That's so right. And we're starting with communion. I morning. know. That was so great. make sure you grab your bread and your juice or coffee if you're at home, but partake. We will be doing communion this morning. It's, it's awesome. Yes. Way yes. to start the year. Uh, additionally, 21 Days of Prayer kicks off next Sunday, January 8th. If you have not done this incredible experience, it's a great way to intentionally connect with God for 21 days straight. So please join us for that. Uh, and if you want more information, you can go to Heartland, uh, heartlandchurch.com and get more information. Also, every Wednesday, our team here at Heartland drops a newsletter. So if you're not receiving that information, please text NEWS to 68000 and get plugged in. There's so many great things happening here at Heartland all the time and you don't want to miss out. We would love for you to be connected. Also, if you are in the Indianapolis or surrounding areas, we have so much room for you. We would love for you to come join us in person if you can. And if you're not, if you're tuning in via YouTube or Facebook, like or uh, like and follow the Heartland page. It would be awesome for you to be able to stay connected in that way. And just join us. We're doing a lot of great things we and we want you to be a part of that with us. So please uh, follow, like the pages, stay connected, or come visit us in person. That would be super amazing too. My husband and I and, and the rest of the Heartland team would absolutely love to get to know you better in person. That's what he was saying is th this morning, 21 days, then starts small groups again. So. I know, I'm excited about that too. And look, being close to God and, and being having a community that loves God and treats people well and, and uh, really shows you the path, like Pastor Nick said in there today, one year. Give it, give it one year, one year and it will change your life. It will. So I would love to, I'm excited to jump back in there. I so know. Online family, just make sure you comment where you're watching from and head inside. So we would love to just connect with you and thank you for being on this journey with us. That's right. Looking forward to Enjoy it. the service and happy and new year, everybody. Happy new year.
say Got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind Oh, so, so long to my old friends Oh, burning in bitterness You can just keep it moving, yeah No, you're not welcome here, yeah Come on, say From now till I walk the streets of gold I sing of how you saved my soul This way when sun has found his way Another one, I am. Hey, I am. come on, I don't hear you. I say, hell lost another hell one. Lost another one. I am say, I am free. I am free. I am free. Say, hell lost another hell one. Lost come on, I feel the freedom. I We're so thankful this morning. We're so thankful for a new year. A new year marks a new beginning and a fresh start. And I know some people in this room this morning, 2022 was not kind to you. And we experienced some things in 2022. We experienced some great losses in 2022. But I believe by faith that 2023 is going to be a year of great victories for all of us. So if you believe that this morning, just repeat after me. It's already done. It's already done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
sing that chorus with me. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. He is risen. Grace is here. Love has triumphed over pray for a moment. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you so much for your grace, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your grace is here right now. We thank you, Lord, that your grace covers us, that your grace keeps us, and that your grace saves us, Lord Jesus. And right now, we are so grateful for your love, Jesus. We thank you that your love is strong enough to cover every single sin, Lord. The song says that your love has triumphed over death. And we are so grateful this morning. And just as you gave yourself for us right now in this moment, we lift our hearts to you and we give ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the Lord praise. He rescued our souls. Praise his name, hallelujah. Today we have a wonderful opportunity at the beginning of this new year to participate in communion together. And I'm gonna ask that if you've not received any of the communion and you need a cup or a, with the bread, please lift your hands. Uh, ushers are right there on the aisle and they'll be more than happy to serve you. It's great to start off a new year this way. And I want, it's my privilege to lead you this morning in communion. You know, Luke the 24th chapter, the apostle writes these words, tells a story. Two men were coming from Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus. They had been lost in all the events that had transpired that weekend. The trial, crucifixion of Jesus. Their hopes were dashed. They had assumed that he was the Messiah, was going to set Israel free. And now they're lost in remorse and they're walking along the road. And a stranger comes up and joins them. And he listens to their conversation and he talks to them for, with them. Luke tells us that this stranger who was there began to open the scriptures to them, took them back to the book of Genesis and began to tell the prophetic meaning of what had transpired that weekend. But these people were so lost in the circumstance of what were happening, they did not recognize who this stranger was. It wasn't until they invited him to dinner when they got to Emmaus that he sat down and he blessed the bread and he broke it. And when he broke it, their eyes were opened and they saw it was Jesus. I wonder how many of us can get lost in all of the events when we come to communion, what transpired yesterday, last night, last year, we do not become mindful of the fact that the presence of Jesus is with us. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Would you take the bread in your hand? As you take that bread in your hand, hold it for a moment. Close your eyes with me. Jesus is here and he hands you that bread. He blesses it as we do right now. Lord, bless this bread as we partake. Thank you for it. And he breaks it and gives it to you. Let's eat. You're here, Lord. Then he takes the cup and he says, this cup is the New Testament or the new covenant. Your sins are forgiven. I've paid the price. It's all done. Drink ye all of it. Let's drink the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the sweetness of your presence and thank you for this day that we can be at the table with you. We look forward to the day when we'll sit at the table in heaven, but right now, heaven is here, and we thank you. Bless your people this morning. As we stand on the brink of a new year, Lord, bless them. Use them mightily. Lord, fulfill your purposes in their lives as we all surrender ourselves to you at the beginning of this year. Thank you that we can celebrate your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to have you here with us. Uh, Happy New Year. We're so glad that you chose the first of the year um, just to be in church to hear from the Lord. And we believe that he has something special in mind for each and every one of you today. Um, while we're here, can we welcome everyone who's joining on, in online? Welcome Harlan Church family. We love you. You picked the right day to tune in. And while we're clapping, can you help me welcome everyone who's here for the first time? Thanks so much for joining us. We're so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday morning here. 
Um, if we haven't met, my name is Andrew, and I serve here on our communications and creative team, um, which is why in a, in a few minutes, um, I'll bring a little bit more to you via video. Um, but before we get to that, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you to take your seats. When you came in this morning, hopefully you received a welcome guide. And inside that, if you haven't seen, is a lot of information about ways you can connect with the church um, and different resources that are available to you. We would love to help you find anything, and we would love just to help um, anything with, uh, with you, anything that's on your journey. And we would love to meet you as well, get to know you a little bit better. So if you would take a moment and fill out that connection card that's in that welcome guide, we would love to um, be able to connect with you further and provide resources for you that might be helpful in your season of life. At the bottom of that connection card, you'll also notice that there's a, por a portion excuse me, for prayer. And here at Heartland, we believe that God delights in the details of our lives, that he listens to these prayers, and we would love for you to share how we can be lifting you up this week. The members of our team pray through these every single week, and as we head into 21 Days of Prayer next week, there's no better time um, to share what God is putting on your heart and how we can be supporting you in that. So please take a moment sometime this morning to fill that out and then drop it in the, drop it in the offering boxes on your way out this morning. Artland, it's going to be an awesome day. We're looking forward to all that God has in store. So as you turn your attention to the screens, um, you'll see a familiar face bringing you a little bit more. Hi, everyone, and Happy New Year. My name is Andrew, and I serve on the communications dream team here at Artland. We are so glad that you chose to be here today. Next Sunday, January 8th, begins our 21 Days of Prayer and we value this time of year so much. And if you're new to Heartland or aren't quite sure what 21 Days of Prayer is, it's a three-week period that we set aside twice a year to pray together as a church. We gather together each weekday from 6 to 7 a.m. and on Saturdays from 9 to 10 a.m. To learn more, check out heartlandchurch.com. If you're new to Heartland and want to learn more about who we are as a church, then make sure to join us at the Heartland Growth Track. Beginning next Sunday at noon in the large conference room, you can take step one of a three-part experience designed to help you grow in your relationship with God, connect to the church, and learn more about the gifts that God has given you. We can't wait to see you there. Again, we are so happy that you're here and we pray God's blessings over you because today is going to be a great day. Well, hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Heartland. Hey, if we've not had the chance to meet yet, my name is Nick Shesky. I'm one of our pastors here, and I just got to tell you, it's such a privilege to get to be here with you on the very first day of the year. Come on. There's nothing like being in the house of the Lord. So good to be with you. And I'm so excited to open up God's Word. And so if you brought a Bible, go ahead and flip open to Matthew chapter 3. That's where we're going to be starting. And while you're flipping there, let me tell you a little bit of where we've been and a little bit of where we're going. Uh, back in December, we started going through the book of Matthew, really chapter by chapter and breaking it down, and it led us right through the middle of a beautiful Advent uh, period of time, expecting the arrival of Jesus. And if you remember, we not just talked about where Jesus came from, but we talked about his hope for you and his hope for me. We talked about the arrival of Jesus and the unexpected birth that Jesus was. We talked about the wise men coming last week, if you watched online, uh, with my parents' house, and you watched that. We talked about the flight to Egypt and the return home. And today I want to continue in chapter 3, in verse 16, where Jesus now is fully grown. He's a, he's a man, some scholars believe he was about 30 years old, and he's getting ready for the beginning of his public ministry. And it starts with a moment of baptism. So chapter 3, verse 16 is where we're going to start. And it says this, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Alighting, it says, resting upon him. And suddenly, a voice from heaven, there came a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I love and I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. Don't, don't miss the significance of this here. Some of us, we've read this story before. This is a history, earth-shattering moment right here. See, for thousands of years, people had been waiting desperately for the arrival of the Messiah, the one who was going to come and not only bring his people back to God, but was going to set up the kingdom of God here on earth, was, was essentially going to come. He'd been the one we were waiting for. And in this moment, Jesus arrives and a voice from heaven says, this is my son. Like, this is the one you've been waiting for. He's here. Get ready. Get. Some of you are not as excited as you were last night when the ball was dropping. Like, you don't understand what we're talking about. Let me, let me put it. This is Rocky doing chin-ups in the barn. You know what I'm saying? 
Drago's got the scientist, but he's doing it out in the field, getting ready. And now he's walking into the ring. And you're like, man, I've been waiting for this. This is um, Daniel-san getting ready for the Tri-Valley Karate Tournament. And he steps onto the mat. You know what I'm talking? All 80s references this morning. Just ready. This is the moment people have been waiting for. And it begs the question, well, what comes next? Like, what happens? And we move right from this beautiful moment where the Spirit of God has descended and he's filled with the Spirit right into chapter 4. And it starts this way. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Today we're starting a series that we're going to be in for the next couple of weeks called Led by the Spirit. Because here's the truth. You know this. I know this. If you've been coming to Heartland for man, 15 years, if you showed up today and it's your first time here, you got dragged by a relative because your flight got canceled by Southwest and you can't get out in time. If you were watching online and you meant to find us, or if you found, we're looking for a cat video and you found us instead, we're really glad you're here. Uh, but all of us know this. We are all being led by something. We're all being led by someone. I don't care if you are the most dynamic leader of all time. If you're the leader of your family, if you're the leader of your business, if you're the leader of your friend group at school, if you're the leader of your sport team, whatever that may be, every single one of us is being led by something. And the question that we're going to pose over this series, and it's the question I want to pose to you right now today, is this. Who or what is leading you? You're going to be led by something in 2023. In fact, most of us, whether you would know it or not, were led by something in 2022. At the beginning of a brand new year, who is leading you? And it's a really important question to ask, because I would argue this. If you don't know who's leading you, there's a pretty good chance you don't know where you're going. Who is leading you? And what we're going to discover in this series, and really in this verse that we're going to read today, the, the temptation of Jesus, is that there is no shortage of forces and voices that are vying for leadership of your life. There's no shortage of it. In fact, there are three in particular that we're going to look at today that I promise you this. These are not just specific to Jesus. These voices and forces will be trying to lead your life in 2023. And the question is, who's leading me? Who is leading me? And the first one, and before I get into this, I got to give credit to my dad. If you were here Legacy Sunday, he spoke and he talked about, really, he, I love the way he phrased it. It was the, the unholy trinity that is coming for, or the unholy trifecta that is coming for families and for you and for me. And, and he kind of broke it down. And it's the same temptation, temptations that Jesus faces, but it's the same one you're going to face today. And the first that we see that Jesus is tempted with is a temptation of the flesh, like of my own body, of my own mind, of my own thoughts, like, like my own body trying to lead and call the shots in my life. Look at the temptation. It says here in verse 2, And when he had fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now this seems like the most obvious verse in the entire New Testament. Like he was hungry after 40 days. Nick, you're so profound. Thank you for giving us such great thoughts. You even highlighted it just to make sure that we didn't miss it. I show this to you because while it seems insignificant, I think that all throughout the New Testament, there are glimpses into Jesus' humanity that are there on purpose for you and for me. Because the truth is, I don't know if you feel this way, but when I read about Jesus sometimes, there's a tendency to go, well, yeah, he was Jesus. So, like, of course he did the things that he did. And, of course, he was nice. And, of course, he, you know, resisted temptation. But I'm not Jesus. That's not me. And it goes out of his way here to say, no, he, he had fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. At Christmas, we talked about the incarnate God coming here, Emmanuel, God with us. And it's like the writer here saying, listen, although he was fully God, don't get it twisted. He was fully human, that divine God came to earth to experience everything that you would experience, the good, the bad, everything, so that he could empathize with you. There is this belief sometimes, and when you think about Christianity, that God is far and distant and doesn't give a rip about what you're going through. And can I just tell you, that's the exact opposite of what we see in the gospel. Jesus came to experience so he could empathize with you today. And I hope that's good news for somebody today, just to know that there's a God in heaven that is not ignorant to your suffering. It's not ignorant to the, thank you all six of you who are really excited about that today. It's going to be a great day. New year, new us, right? Here we go. Um, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Like, if you are who you say you are, then turn these stones into bread. It shouldn't be hard for you if you're the son of God. Do this. And some of you, and really for us, 
reading this, we ask the question, like, what's the big deal? Like, really? And some of you, you read this and you're like, he was tempted to eat carbs. That's the big deal. Like, I get it. 2023, I'm going to be tempted to eat carbs. It's not about the carbs. Don't, don't miss what Jesus is trying to get at because of the vehicle that it's brought through. We see the thing beneath the thing, the real temptation, comes in how Jesus answers the tempter. And he says this. He says, he answered, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man doesn't live on bread alone. And some of you go, wow, Jesus, that is so wise. Jesus got this from scripture. This is Deuteronomy chapter eight, and God is speaking to the Israelites, and he's giving them commandments and, and laying down the law to them so they can understand. And one of the things that he says, he gives us a glimpse into the Israelites in the Old Testament and their dependence on God. I don't know if you know your biblical history, but when the Israelites escaped Egypt, they were in the wilderness where there was no food. And so what happened? God says, I will provide for you. You're my kids. I love you. I'll provide for you daily. This idea of your daily bread, it comes from this idea that we're talking about right here. And so I am going to give you manna from heaven, which was, it was used to create bread. I will give you your daily bread every day. Your source is from me. And God would say, and don't concern yourself about getting stuff for other days, because if you try, it will wither in your hand. Well, stubborn, you know, same thing you and I would do. The Israelites go out and they see more than they need, and they go, I need that. And so they go and they collect it. Well, Scripture tells us that when they collected it, it withered in their hands. One of the passages says that maggots actually came up out of it the very next day. And this thing that was beautiful to them is now gross to them. And I love this picture that it shows right here, because what we see it is not about the carbs. Jesus is the bread of life, okay? It's not about the carbs. Thank you all six of you who got that joke. That's going to be really funny on the way home today. You'll be like, oh, that was a good dad joke. Um, it's not about the bread. The thing beneath the thing is that within this, there is a temptation, really a question. Do I trust that God is providing for me? Do I really trust that God knows not just what I want, but he knows what I need and what I don't need? And what you see here, and, and quite honestly, temptations of the flesh that we're talking about, I don't need to elaborate on a ton because I think many of us are familiar with this. They always express themselves as overindulgence. But the thing beneath the thing is that it comes down to, do I trust that God is sustaining me even when it feels like I don't have what I need? Do I trust that even though I want something, that God is fulfilling my needs? And can I tell you how this shows up when, when I look at this? I'll, I'll give you some examples. My wife and I, we've been youth pastors for, what, 10 years almost? And we've dealt with students and leaders and parents that have all wrestled um, with the overindulgence of sexuality. It's in our culture. It's all over the place, from pornography to sex outside of marriage. To, you know, we've dealt with people that have gone through this stuff, and, and it's heartbreaking dealing with some, some of this sometimes because people would, I, I think most people, when you talk to them about this subject matter, would say, man, I don't want to do the thing that I'm doing. I don't want to do it. But underneath it, there is some sort of hurt or loneliness that says, well, I'm lonely. That's not good. I'm not experiencing something that I need. So I need to take matters into my own hands and go get the thing that I think that I need. Well, what do we know about pornography or sex outside of marriage? That for the most part, it seems alluring. But when I take matters into my own hands and I provide for myself, I actually end up quenching the voice of the Holy Spirit or quenching it because I am acting as God saying, well, this is what I need. And here's what I need. Do you think it would have been hard for Jesus to turn these rocks into bread? No. But what Jesus is saying, no, I know where my source is and where my provider is coming from. And I don't have to take matters into my own hands because he is sustaining me. He knows what I need. If you know anybody, or maybe this is your story where there's substance abuse or alcohol abuse as well too, same line of thinking, the idea of, man, I, there's some sort of hurt or something that's been unresolved, and I think that this will get me where I need to go or, or help me with what I need. And so I overindulge. It always shows up as overindulgence, but really it's a trust thing underneath it. It's the same with overeating. And I, I'm going to get in your face if I haven't gotten in your face already, I promise. It's happy January 1st. It's going to be great. Many of us, when we think of overindulgence, we think of, man, you know, sex outside of marriage, pornography, we think of alcoholism or substance abuse or overindulging in food. I wonder how many of us, if we rolled the tape back in last year, we overindulged in the fears and uh, fears that we hold and the fears that were leading us throughout our life. It says in scripture that God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
And yet I think there are people that would say, if I rolled back 2022, fear was the primary driver of my life. Fear of tomorrow, fear of what was going to happen. Are we really going to go into a recession? Is the political system ever going to get better? Fear of, are we going to get this COVID thing again and have to go back into quarantine? Fear of, are my kids going to go off the rails? I don't know what your fear is, but I think for some of us, come on, we are mind, body, spirit, the indulgence to live out of a place of fear. And you know this, that when you live and you're guided by fear, it actually can manifest the very thing that you're afraid of. This is the parent that is afraid that their kid is going to go off the rails. So they say, well, we got to do something about this and we're cutting the internet out of our house. We're going to go turn our own butter and go live on a farm and go somewhere and stitch our own clothes. Well, what happens? The kid gets resentful of, man, I'm missing out on what everybody else is experiencing. It feels so rigid and locked tight and that becomes my view of God and the kid rebels. And it's the opposite for a parent that goes, well, I don't want to be like my rigid, crazy family that took us to church every single week, and so I'm going to let go of all restraints, and I'm going to give a cell phone to a 14-year-old, access to the internet at every moment of the day, and expect that their mental health is just going to be okay. You see what I'm saying? Am I in your face yet? Do you, do you feel this? We good? We love each other? Okay. This is what I'm getting at, though, this, this idea. I don't know where the flesh pokes its head with you, but I do know that the flesh inhibits the voice of the Holy Spirit because it takes our dependence off God and it puts the dependence on what I think that I need. I remember taking a group of kids, 16 of them, to Costa Rica on a missions trip, which if you've never done that before, Lord bless you. It is, it's awesome, but we thought we lost some kids at some point, and when you come back with 15 out of 16, that is still an F. Like, you still fail. <laughs> You're getting fired, like, real quick. But I remember we took these 16 kids and we walked through one of the poorest areas of the city in Costa Rica that we were in, and I watched teenagers from America just bawl. And when we sat down and we debriefed it later, what, what did we say? We said, we said well, why, what, what, what did that stir up in you? And they said, there were, there were some kids that were crying because of the immense poverty that they saw, but there were a couple kids that went, yeah, there was great poverty, and they didn't have what they really needed, but they were worshiping God like I've never worshiped God before. Like there was such joy and like they had such an understanding of the fact that everything that we do have has come from God, that he's our sustainer. And it's actually the removal of some things, the, 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 the quelching back of my flesh that's actually bringing me closer and deeper into a relationship with God. And I'll never forget one of the kids that actually looked at us and said, I wonder if the reason why I'm not worshiping God like that is because I have everything that I think I need. Like I'm wondering, like, like could it be? And can I tell you, this is why we do the 21 days of prayer. You heard about it on the announcement video. We're going to do that starting next Sunday and then every single day we do it. Part of the reason, can I let you know a secret, why we do it so early, we are curbing the flesh. I'll tell you this, Monday morning, you're going to come to 21 days and you'll be like, praise the Lord, this is awesome. The following Monday morning, that alarm's going to go off and it's like Satan himself is yelling at you. I don't know if I can go. The dog's going to throw up on the living room floor. Something's going to happen. And be like, well, I just can't go today. I can't, I can't do it. Come on, part of this is, yes, I'd rather stay in my bed. My body would like that. But I believe that there's a God in heaven that wants to speak to me and has something better for my life than I could ever ask or imagine. And so, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but comfort was never the goal. I believe this, and, and we've talked about this before. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, that I think comfort, the spirit of comfort that we live in today is actually inhibiting the spirit of God speaking to us. Now, here's the beautiful part of this, because some of you are like, I, 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 I promise you this, I don't know where the flesh is poking you. I don't know. So take a deep breath. I'm not, a, I'm not your enemy. I'm here for you, with you. But God does. And I bet you if you ask that question, who's leading me, watch as God would begin to reveal and go, hey, I wonder if you've become comfortable in a couple areas that are making it hard for you to hear me. Because let me tell you, I promise you, in 2023, the flesh is coming for you. Teenagers, the flesh is coming for you. And here's the beauty. You get to pre-decide before you go into 2023 who's going to lead me. And when you pre-decide, you go, okay, I'm pre-deciding that before I get into the moment, before I go down in the basement where I'm not supposed to go and do the thing that I'm not supposed to do, I'm pre-deciding that the Holy Spirit is going to reign in my life and reign supreme. And so I'm going to listen to that voice. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? You get that? The flesh is coming for you, but I promise this. What you see in the second one is that the world is coming for you as well, too. The voice of the world. Jesus is tempted again by the devil, and it says, Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, again, that language, if you are the Son of God, come on, the devil is a liar, and you know it, throw yourself down, for it is written, and he quotes scripture at him, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
throw yourself off in front of a crowd of onlookers and watch as these angels protect you and keep you. Because didn't God tell you that nothing bad was supposed to happen to you and you're going to be okay? And if you just threw yourself, it would be great. Henry Nouwen, he was a Christian writer and thinker. He writes about this and he said, the temptation here is not actually about doing an amazing feat. It's about proving that you are spectacular. Let me tell you this, nothing would have gained Jesus more fame and popularity than throwing himself in front of a crowd of onlookers and having angels, let me, if I went up in these rafters up here and I jumped down and angels caught me and brought me back to the stage, this place would fill up and you'd be talking about it for the rest of your natural life. You'd be like, remember when that crazy white kid jumped off the rafters and angels caught him and they brought him here? I believe that the narrative of 2023, what we're getting ready to go into, it doesn't matter if you're on social media, if you're not on social media, whatever, if you're Gen Z, Gen X, Boomer, whatever you are, the constant theme of our world is prove that you are valuable. Prove that you're valuable. Prove that you can do it. Prove that you can make it. Prove that you're the best dad in your neighborhood. Prove that you're the hardest working person in your company. Prove that you've got it all together and that your curated Instagram feed really is as good as it looks. Like prove that you can do this. And here's the problem. What you might hear me saying is, well, just loaf, like sit back and don't, don't do anything. And you know, just God's got it. So just relax and go to sleep. Like, that's not what I'm saying. God actually says, do everything unto the Lord. So we're pursuing excellence as we do things. Like everything I'm doing, I might be doing it for my boss, but I'm doing it to honor God with what I'm doing. Problem is when my identity gets interwoven with my performance, I will either burn out or I will blow up. I'll do one of the two. I will either burn myself into the ground trying to prove by the sweat of my own brow that I'm good and I've made it, or that speed and intensity will, not, will match up with a lack of character and I will blow off and morally I'll go off the rails. And can I tell you, you see this in culture all the time. Doesn't it feel like every other day somebody's getting canceled for something who was at one point awesome and then something happened and they either blew up or they burn out? Or I mean, think about famous athletes that have stopped playing because I can't handle the pressure of things that are going on right now. Think of executives that have had their entire companies destroyed because of one moment of scandal or something that they stepped into that they thought, well, nobody will know about this. Or, no, 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 you'll either burn up or blow up. And I'm telling you, this is so pervasive in our culture, this idea of, well, if I could just get what the world seems is valuable, I would be okay. But the truth, and you and I both know this, that's not how it works. Because the second you get where you think you're going to be, watch as that there's another level that you have to work to and achieve to and get to. And if you don't get to that, well, then you're going to go backwards. Um, Gen Zers who are sleeping in the room because you were awake too late last night. Hello? Anybody? Okay, great. Post Malone talks about this. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't know who Post Malone is, do not Google his picture. It will scare you in the middle of the church right now. <laughs> he writes a song called Rich and Sad, which kind of speaks for itself. But he writes a song. And what's he say? All the stunting couldn't satisfy my soul. I got a hundred big places, but I still feel alone. Come on, you know this, right? This is a secular artist writing and saying, I got everything I thought I wanted, but it didn't make a difference in my life. And what Jesus is getting at here is saying, and he's tempting him, saying, prove that you're spectacular and you can do it. I wonder how many, if we rolled the tape back on 2022, you would say, I am so tired from just trying to keep it all together, to prove that I got it all together. And you know what's amazing about Jesus is Jesus sniffs this out and he responds and he says this, oh, listen, it is written, again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And, and this is only part of the quote, but he's quoting Deuteronomy again. And the real quote in Deuteronomy, it says this. It says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. And some of you go, well, what was Massa? Well, I'm really glad you asked. Massa was a place in the Middle East that after the Israelites had escaped captivity from Egypt, they came up against the Red Sea. It looked like there was nowhere to go. God opens up the Red Sea, and the Israelites walk through the Red Sea to the other side on dry ground. And when they get to the other side, God closes the sea over the Egyptians, just completely destroys the enemies that are pursuing them. And they stand there, and they turn back, and they look at this. And can you just, just put yourself in their shoes for a second? The fear and awe and trembling that you would be witnessing. Some of you have experienced this because God's been faithful in your life before, and you've seen him do amazing things. And you go, oh my gosh. God, I can't believe that you're as big and powerful and mighty as you are. It's amazing that you did this. He proves his faithfulness. Not only will I take care of you, but y'all are mine. Like, you're my kids. I take care of you. Just trust me. And you know what's amazing? A couple of verses later, they're in Massa, and the people start grumbling, and they look at Moses and say, go find out if God's actually with us or not, because we don't have water, and we need water. So go find out. 
And can I tell you, this is so offensive to the Spirit of God who would say, dude, did y'all forget that I just brought you through this stuff? That, that now you're going, well, is God really for me, or do we need to figure out how to get water ourselves? Or, or what, do we, what do we need? And you say, no, 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 don't, don't tempt the Lord like you tempted him there. Don't test his faithfulness. And why I love this verse of how Jesus responds is what we see here is a supremely confident Jesus. Well, confident in what? Confident in who he was, confident in who his father is, and confident that nothing can shake that. Like, I don't have to perform magic tricks to make me believe that God is real and that he's with me and he's for me. Jesus is defending his identity in God right here and saying, uh, uh, if you are the son of God, I am the son of the most high God. And you and I are children of God adopted through Christ and what he did on the cross for us. The reality is this. I don't have to prove anything to you. I have nothing to prove because I know who I am. I know what Christ has done in me. And I know that he's given me a hope and a future that's better than I can ask or imagine. And yet, the voice of the world still comes. So it's exciting, and we get pumped about it in church, but I promise you, you're going to walk out of here, and the voice is going to creep right back in and say, hey, prove it. Prove that you're a good husband. Prove that you can do this. And not just, hey, be a good husband, but prove to somebody else that you matter and you're lovable. And can I tell you, I'm going to keep coming back to this. It's why, in this season, Jesus, before this, was fasting and praying for 40 days. It's why we're going into a season where we're going to fast as a church. Can I tell you this? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what you should fast. That would be legalism. But I would ask the question, where does the world have its voice loudest to you, and how do we turn down the noise of the world around you? I'll tell you mine personally, and do this if you want. Don't do this. I don't care. This is what God's told me to do. For the last... Five 21 days of prayer, I've done a social media fast, and I've deleted all the social media apps off my phone, um, and some Gen Zer just fell out of their chair in this room just thinking, what? Really? I deleted it all because I've noticed in myself a propensity that, man, I, I spend a lot of time more concerned about what the rest of the world is saying than what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to me on a regular basis. Some of you go, really? Like, really? I'll tell you this, what I did. I did an experiment. I removed the social media apps off my phone, and I put the Bible app right where my Instagram was. I can't tell you how many times during the day where I was bored, or I was in between meetings, or my wife was talking to me, and I pull out. I admitted it, so you can't be mad at me. I said it out loud. I pull out my phone, and I would just instinctually click on where the Instagram app was. And I would click on the Bible app instead, and I go, oh, I didn't mean, oh, 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 wait. God, you're my priority. This is where the value is. And I'm not dogging on it. If you don't have a problem with it, fantastic. Good for you. I got a problem with it. So I had to cut it out of my life and say, Holy Spirit, I need you to speak to me and do something. I don't know what you fast, but we're going to talk all about the different kind of fast during 21 days of prayer. I wonder what it would be like if you were open and just said, man, God, I don't know what the next three weeks I'm going to cut back, but I do know that the voice of the world drowns out the voice of the Spirit. Let me, let me tell you, one of my favorite things about God, he's not going to shout at you or force himself on you. No, he speaks in a small, still whisper that when I finally get quiet, I hear him speaking to me. And that's where I'm reminded again of who I am. That Man, I don't need to tempt God because I know that I'm his son. I know he cares about me. I know he loves me. Listen, the flesh is coming for you. I tell you, the world is coming after you. And the third one, and, and quite honestly, this one is the one that it, it scares people, but I think, think we need to talk about it. It's the devil himself is coming after you. He's coming after you. In the third temptation of Jesus, it says this. It says, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Like if you just fall down and you worship me, I'll give you everything. What's so interesting is all throughout the Bible, even back at the beginning of creation, when the devil, Lucifer, was created, he was associated with worship. He was, I don't have time to get into all of it today, but he was the worship leader of heaven that was responsible for guiding and gearing and leading the worship of praise to God. And somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, scholars believe that this is when Lucifer fell. And you go, well, what does fell mean? It means at one point, he shifted the direction of the worship. And said, okay, instead of us worshiping God, I want you to worship me. Like, like I, I want the worship. In fact, Isaiah 14 gives us a little picture into exactly what was going on and what was being said. And it says this, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. This is talking about the devil. You have been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart and watch this five declarative. I will statements. I will ascend to the heavens. 
Like, I will be higher than God. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, and I will make myself like the most high God. I will direct my, my goal is to just direct worship away from God towards me. And Jesus talks about this moment when this happened. And Jesus says, you remember this? He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I heard a pastor talk about this one time. It got me so excited just thinking about it because I don't think about this. He didn't say, I watched it happen like Avatar 2, where it was like three hours, way too long of just fighting and back and forth and good guys are up and now it's down and then there's this upward rising action. No, it says like lightning. Like I had all these thoughts, I will, I will, I will. And like lightning fast, you were cast out of heaven. And then in Genesis 1, if you read the one in your Bible today, it says that God created you and me in his image. And we were created to worship God, to bring worship to God. So not only has Satan been replaced, but now you and me and all of us are the direct worship leaders of heaven, bringing glory to God through everything that we do. And that sounds exciting, but here's the truth. The devil hates you for that. He hates you for that. And can I just give you the scouting report on our enemy real quick? Just, just I'll show it to you. It's really simple. How do I divert people's worship from God to anything else? I actually don't care if you worship me. Just don't worship God. Like, I hate God. So if I could derail your worship in any way from him, if I could, you know, and you know what he'll do? He'll send distraction your way. Man, if I could just get you to worship something else, like your career or your kid's sports career, if I could, you know, <laughs> career, if I could get you to worship something else, man, then I would be accomplishing my mission and I'd be pushing it, pushing you in the way I want you to go. Just distracted. I, I, I think, hate me for saying this, I think there's a world of cultural Christians that are distracted from the immensity and power of God because I've just gotten comfortable going to church. And listen, God wants more for you than just your church attendance. Like, it's amazing you're here on January 1st. Real Christians, way to go. Like, this is fantastic. But God wants more for you than just sit in a seat. He's called more for you than that. And not only will the devil throw distraction, but come on, you know this. He'll throw difficulty at you. He will throw doubts at you. Well, if you really are the son of God, what do you mean if I am the son of God? God himself just told me that I am his son just a few minutes ago. But what do I do? I'll raise some doubts. If God really loved you, this bad thing wouldn't be happened to you. This person wouldn't have left. The person wouldn't have died. Your kids wouldn't have gone off the rails. If God really loved you, and you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. He'll throw, he'll throw despair at you. I think one of the greatest tools the enemy uses, and it's so subtle, is never and always language. You know that little whisper comes, it'll never get better. It will always be this way. My kids will never come to know Jesus. I will always be alone for the rest of my life. I will never be able to overcome this addiction. I will always be wrapped up in this thing that I'm, do you see what I'm saying? And we begin to believe the lie. Well, I guess I don't know if I really am the son of God. When in reality, look at how Jesus responds. I, I love the confidence of Jesus. And, and this is the confidence. Come on, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you and me. And he says this, away with you, Satan. Like resist the devil, flee temptation. Like, like away from you. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. This is supreme confidence. No, I know what I'm about. I've, I've pre-decided that my life is gonna be about worshiping God. And so when I get into the difficulty, well, of course there's difficulty. I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil because I know that God's with me right even in the middle of it. I know that I have doubts, but God can handle my doubts, and he invites me to share his doubts with them. I know that I'm going to have enemies, but God, you've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows and runs over, and surely your goodness and mercy, come on, what? It'll follow me all the days of my life. You're leading me. My whole life is to worship you. That's why I exist. He responds with this great rebuke. And, and listen, I think the greatest thing that the enemy would try to do is make you think like he is some horror movie or he doesn't exist. And I think there's a subtle in-between. Scripture talks about how he's veiled as an angel of light. When in reality, I think the battle that the enemy try to wage on us most of the time is right up here. And say, no, 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 no. That sounds like doubt. That sounds like a never. That sounds like an always. But my God always supplies according to his riches and his mercy. I know this. And I know that in a message like this, we talk about this is really inspiring and we could go home and this would be great. But some of you are saying, practically, Nick, how do I do this? Because when you talked about the flesh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And when you talked about the world, I can feel it creeping at me even now. And when you talk about, come on, when you talk about 
diverting your worship. I can feel my worship being diverted. What do I do? Can I tell you, I think the most damaging thing I could do is try to come up with three points for how do you stop sinning? <laughs> three points for here's how you fight temptation and you'll never experience it again if you just do. I, listen, I don't know what God's convicting you on. And in fact, my job is not to sit up here and tell you what you should and should not do. That's between you and the Holy Spirit to go, Holy Spirit, you convict me. You guide me. We open God's word and God's word is a two-edged sword that can divide to the bone. I don't need to tell you what to stop doing. What I do want to do is tell you one thing to start doing. And it comes straight out of the very first verse that we read today, back in Matthew chapter 3. And he says this, when he had been baptized, right, he came immediately up out of the water and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in this moment. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you see the personal language in this? The intimacy in this. This wasn't just, hey, some guy got baptized. That's my kid. That's my son. I'm your father. You know me. Can I tell you this? I think this statement right here was more for the people around Jesus than even Jesus. Because you remember when Jesus got left in the temple, they came and found him. And what'd they say? He said, did you not think to look for me in my father's house? Like I've known my father intimately, deeply. I spent time with him. I've, I've, I've communed with him. I've got close to him. And I think some of you, you need to stop trying so hard to not do bad things. And the reality is you just need to start a real relationship with Jesus and get close to him. And I emphasize real because I think there's a lot of people that would claim a relationship with Jesus and it's not doing a lick of difference in their life. I know about him, but I don't know him. Like I know that he was a guy that existed, but I don't know the Holy Spirit power of having him in my life and work from the inside out and say, well, how do I do that? And I'll tell you this, I don't even need to tell you what to do other than just come before God humbly. Starting a relationship with Jesus is as easy as coming to him and just saying, God, I need you. Stop trying to figure out what you need to do next and just start here. And for those of you that accepted Jesus at one point in your life and you feel far from him, can I tell you, God has never been far from you. He's loved you. He's been so close to you this entire time. And I promise you this, when you start getting close to Jesus, watch how the things that go along with Jesus become interesting to you as you do this. If the desire of my heart in 2023, who's going to lead me? Is it going to be my fear? Is it going to be the world? Is it going to be my flesh? What, what's going to lead me? If I say, I want it to be the Spirit of God, watch as that begins to inform the rest of the decisions that I make. Because I'm not just doing them to make God happy, but I'm doing them to get close to God. So like this, we talk about the one-year Bible. Can I tell you, as your pastor, there are moments that I don't want to do the one-year Bible. I wake up in the morning, and I'm reading out of the book of Numbers, and I don't understand what's going on. But I know that when I spend time in the presence of God, he speaks to me. And that he can speak to any situation that I'm in. Some of you, you'd say, I want to get close to God. Start a relationship with him and open your Bible. Watch as the things that before seemed like work. You go, oh man, I need the presence of God in my life. Watch as some of you, you start a real relationship with God. And suddenly the idea of getting in a group doesn't seem so daunting because you go, no, God, you're convicting me to get plugged into a group and to talk with some people about what God's trying to do in my life. Listen, Jesus's plan for your life is bigger than just sin mitigation. It's bigger than just be a good moral person and pay your tithe every once in a while. We say this, Jesus came to give life and life to the full, that you would experience freedom. It says for freedom's sake, you've been set free, that, that you wouldn't just carry on the baggage of yesterday, but that you'd be able to walk freely into the world, say, no, I know who I am. I'm a child of the most high God. And when temptation comes my way, <laughs> get out of here. I don't even need to talk to you anymore because I know who I am. Watch as you get close to God and he empowers you. Some of y'all gonna get into a freedom group this year. Can I just give a public admission? When I first did freedom, I thought it was for alcoholics. You remember I told you that? I hate to say that, but some of you aren't laughing because you think the exact same thing too. And you're like, that's for people with problems. Guess what? We all got problems. And I went in and I got free of some stuff that I didn't even know was lurking in the depths of my heart. Scripture says, who can know the depths of evil in the human heart? Can I tell you so? It didn't come from just going, well, I better just go to that group. It came from God convicting me and saying, hey, you know, the more time I spend with you, hey, I think this is probably your next step that you need to take. You see what I'm saying? The closer I get to Jesus, man, the closer he gets to me. And the louder I can hear him and the louder the voice of the Spirit becomes in my life. And I, and I beg the question again. I just want to ask, 
Who or what is leading you? Do you know? Is it your fears? Is it the failures of the past? Is it the hurt from yesterday? Is it the flesh that's continuing to just rear its head at you? Or is it the spirit of God that you say, I regularly hear God speaking to me and talking to me and teaching me things through his word? Because can I tell you, go back to what I said. If you don't know who you're leading, you don't know where you're going. But if I know that God, the Holy Spirit, you're leading my life, I can trust that you're leading me in the way everlasting. And this morning, I want to pray for somebody who would say, I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. I've tried leading myself, and it's led to natural disaster. I need supernatural intervention in my life. I need the God of heaven to come and live inside of me. And I'd love to pray for you even right now. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, where you're at, I want to pray. And I want to pray specifically for somebody that would say, I'm tired of trying to do this on my own. I've tried to live my own way, and it's not working. I can't do another year like last year. If that's you and you're ready to make the decision to accept Jesus into your heart today, I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender, of giving your life to him. If that's you and you're ready to make that decision all across this room right now, just raise your hand. I'd love to include you on a prayer. Yep, in the back, all over the room. Hands coming up. Yep. This is between you and God. If you're watching online right now, you're listening back on the podcast, raise your hand where you're at. God sees you even from afar. He knows you. Come on, if that's you, say this prayer with me. Say this. Say, Jesus, I need you. God, I'm sorry for trying to do things my own way, for leading my own life. But God, I thank you for sending your son to die for me so that I could experience everlasting life. Would you come into my life? Would you change me? Would you use me? God, help me to never be the same. Father, God, I pray for every person that just prayed that prayer. And God, I rejoice and I celebrate, God, for new life that is found in you. God, I thank you that the best is yet to come. And God, I pray that in the coming days, God, even as we go into the 21 days, God, that you would you would just unleash the full brunt of your grace on them. God, they would experience you like never before. God, this would just be the beginning. And God, a year from now, they'd look back and say, I don't even recognize myself and the person that I was because of the life-changing work in Jesus. Father, we praise you and we worship you. We thank you for the confidence that comes in serving and honoring you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we all prayed together and said, amen. Amen. Come on, can we congratulate everybody that just made that decision? So proud of you. Love you guys. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Nick, for bringing the teaching this morning. That's so good. I know I'll be asking myself, is my first priority doing life with Jesus and led by him? Um, if, you, if you made that decision today to start a real relationship with Jesus and that's the first time or if you're coming back, we couldn't be happier for you. Um, we would love to cheer you on just to equip you and help you out on your spiritual journey. So if you would let us know, there is a little spot on the connection card where you can mark that you made a decision today. If you turn that in or you can text the word begin to 68,000 and you'll even receive a free devotional book um, that will walk you through some of the things that it is to start a relationship with Jesus. So we would love to set you up with that and just be a part of your journey together. And church, now it's time to worship God through our offering. So we bring our first to God. We know that he blesses first things um, and, and our tithes and our offerings are the first of what we receive from him. We know that he's a God of great abundance, of immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. So we're just a, a, a blessed church to be able to be a part of what he's doing all around our city, nation, and world. If you'd like to give, all the ways are on the screens. And if you'd like to give physically, you can use the offering boxes that are in the tunnels on your way out this morning. As you're getting your connection card and offering ready, I just want to remind you, 21 Days of Prayer does start next Sunday, um, and we'd love nothing more for than each and every one of you to be here with us. And then through the week, on weekdays, we'll be here at 6 a.m. to worship together, to pray, to go after God, and to hear the words that he has specifically for each one of you in this season of life. So make sure to be there. Um, we would love to be a part of that together. Uh, let's stand and pray one more time together, church. As we head out this morning, members of our prayer team will be here along the front. And if you'd like prayer for anything at all, um, please come forward as we're exiting. And they would be more than happy to pray with you and pray for you this morning. Let's go to God together. 
Jesus, we love you this morning. God, we thank you for all that you've done already, all the teaching that you've brought us and that you've um, brought us safely into this next year, God. We thank you for the grace for each breath in our lungs. We don't take it for granted, um, but God, we ask that you would equip us and that you would bless us this year and this week as we go out into our spheres of influence, our workplaces and our families our times of work and rest, God. Would you help us to be an impact for you and your kingdom, God? Would you bless us to be a blessing that we would overflow with what you've given us into the lives of those around us? We love you, God, and we'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We love you so much, church. Keep coming back. So, say- 